Javier Millet has been elected president of Argentina. How did this far right-wing candidate emerge victorious? Gaza's Indonesian hospital has once again become the target of Israel's genocidal war. We bring you the latest from these attacks. This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Far right-wing candidate Javier Millet has been elected president of Argentina. Millet, who is often described as a libertarian, defeated Sergio Massa, the economy minister of the incumbent Frontier Todos government of Alberto Fernandez. Millet has been extremely controversial for his strange proposals, which include dollarization and massive cuts to spending, including the elimination of entire ministries. He has also signaled he will move away from BRICS and stand by the US and Israel. To understand this strange or not so strange result, we have with us Zoe Alexandra. Zoe, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, a surprise result, it would almost seem a very closely fought election, of course. But maybe for you, could you first take us through what are the developments, so to speak, from this election? What are the results? You know, who is Javier Millet for that matter? Well, on Sunday, November 19th, Argentinians went to the poll for the second round of the presidential elections to decide between uh, Javier Millet, who is a far right, a uh, libertarian from the Liberty Advances Party, and uh, Sergio Massa, who is the presidential candidate for the center-left ruling coalition uh, Union for the Homeland. Um, and in these polls, Javier Millet will emerge victorious with around 99.3% uh, of the votes counted. Uh, Millet had already scored 55.7% uh, of the vote, um, with Sergio Massa trailing behind uh, with just 44.3% of the vote. This, these results were somewhat a surprise. Um, in the first round of the presidential elections, um, after uh, Sergio Massa had fallen behind in the primaries, he made sort of a record comeback and actually pulled in first with uh, Javier Millet uh, coming in second and having maintained kind of the same amount of votes that he had received in the Paso primary elections in August. So many thought, okay, uh, Javier Millet won the primaries, Sergio Massa won the first round of the elections, um, and it seemed that Sergio Massa was continuing to accumulate votes. Many of the opinion polls just after the, the first round of the election had seen uh, Sergio Massa continuing to hold this lead. However, in the past week, uh, most of the major uh, opinion polls that were that were released actually showed uh, them at a, in a technical tie with many of the major pollsters actually having Javier Millet a little bit ahead of Sergio Massa. So slightly unexpected. I think many people were shocked um, just because of the 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 level of vitriol and hatred in. Um, the programs, the policies, the discourse of Javier Millet, many people did not think it would be possible for such a figure, such a character to actually come to the presidency. If you see videos of Javier Millet, uh, he exhibits erratic uh, behavior, he screams, he shouts, um, he goes to protests, he goes to rallies with uh, chainsaws, um, his proposals for the economy, which in Argentina right now, the economy is in dire straits and, and many can actually link his rise even to the, the economic situation itself. However, his policies, while they are policies of radical change, uh, they're not necessarily change for the better. He proposes the dollarization of the Argentine economy. He also proposes the dissolution of the central bank, cutting most ministries in the country, ministries, secretaries, all major government programs. So a severe, severe austerity budget, um, making university, making healthcare no longer free, um, really hacking away at the basic rights of Argentinians. Um, and while these again are radical proposals, they will most definitely cause a deterioration of the economic situation, which again, 40% of the population in Argentina is living below the poverty line. In 2022, inflation was 100%. Uh, and 
uh, many economists from across the world have commented that these proposals will really do nothing to address that uh, this crisis. So it is, I think, an upset for many, um, both in terms of the economic recovery of, the, of Argentina, of the Argentinian people, um, but also, of course, in the area of human rights, this was a huge issue. Um, this is actually the 40th anniversary of the return to democracy in Argentina uh, from the last civic military dictatorship. And uh, Javier Millet and his running mate they essentially are people who deny uh, the full impact of the dictatorship. Um, they say that the numbers widely used by human rights organizations in Argentina and across the globe are hugely inflated, that people use human rights um, to, to do criminal activity, use the guise of human rights to conduct criminal activity. Uh, generally, what uh, they call in Argentina denialist attitude, saying that the dictatorship wasn't that bad, they're exaggerating, uh, this is all false, the whole idea of human rights is just made up. So this is, again, extremely concerning in a country um, that has fought extremely hard, um, not only for those social and economic rights, but also um, this historical memory in the country um, and, and many different processes of fighting for justice, fighting for truth about what happened in dictatorship. So this is another thing that's that's hugely concerning, as well as, of course, the attacks on the rights of minorities, the rights of women that he has promised to carry forth. So all in all, I think it was a huge upset uh, you know, not just for Argentina, but really for people across the world, seeing uh, what many describe as a fascist leader with fascist ideas, um, you know, emerge victorious. Um, and we've seen a lot of people responding worldwide, both political leaders, social movements, um, quite quite concerned for what, for what this means. Um, and I think many have also pointed out that the progressive wave in Latin America is very uh, fragile. Um, this is a wave that's happening within the structure of liberal democracies, um, where you know these these terms that the progressive leaders win are last four years, and then once again, um, you know, in, in for example, in Argentina, the far right has has is clearly these ideas have been growing in society. So I think it's it's a wake up call for many. Many people are saying, how do we evaluate what happens? How do we move forward? Um, and I think that it will be it will be a tough uh, it will be a tough couple of years for Argentina. Right, like you said, of course, uh, you know, very difficult circumstances in Argentina. Could you maybe talk a bit more about those circumstances? Because the question always is, when a candidate like Javier Millet wins, what are the conditions which led to the emergence of someone like him? Well, there has been a lot of speculation. Exactly, how did this happen? How could someone with such radical and crazy uh, ideas win the elections in Argentina? And I think uh, it is impossible to understand the rise of Javier Millet without understanding what's been happening in the country for the past eight years, um, what has been happening on the economic front, what's been happening with the lawfare campaign against Cristina de Kirchner and uh, other people in the Peronist bloc. Um, but I think the economic factor has had a huge impact. Um, as we know that during the government of Mauricio Macri, uh, he took out a several billion dollar loan from the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, um, and quickly plunged the country into a crisis. Um, he also enacted very harsh austerity measures, um, cutting again several key ministries, cutting social programs, um, trying to raise uh, the, the public services tariff. And so many of these um, started to aggravate the economic situation. He takes out the IMF loan um, to allegedly fix the economy and he did not do that. Um, and the, con the country continued to have uh, the currency be devaluated. Um, the, the peso lost its value, I think, in the span of a couple of years, it devaluated around 500%. Um, we saw inflation go up massively. This was accompanied by, of course, the socioeconomic indicators, rising of rising of unemployment, 
um, rising of number of people living in poverty, the number of people uh, living in a state of homelessness. So these were all occurring under the Mauricio Macri government, the economic deterioration, privatization of key state goods, um, all of these happening all at once. And then uh, from this uh, discontent, from this feeling that Macri had really driven the country into the ground, uh, he's defeated in the 2019 elections against Alberto Fernandez. Alberto Fernandez running, of course, um, for the uh, Frente de Todos coalition, bringing together many left and progressive uh, groups, um, really with this message of change and with this message of economic recovery. However, Alberto Fernandez is sworn in. A couple months later, the pandemic happens. Uh, he, of course, he takes very strict lockdown measures. Um, but at the same time, um, the country is still in this economic crisis. And he he's coming from this broad coalition, which is the Frente de Todos, where there's many, many different tendencies. And it is a Peronist, Peronist uh, coalition, but it has sectors from the right, sectors from the center. Um, and while the left called for radical economic transformation, uh, for you know, uh, appropriating uh, failing companies, um, being able to boost uh, na the national economy, the national production, um, Alberto Fernandez uh, appeared to not have the will to really carry this forward. This was seen, of course, when he attempted to um, take over Vicentin, which had uh, which was uh, falling on bankruptcy, um, and this caused the move by his government to try to do this, caused a huge uproar. Um, many accuse him of being Castro Chavista, of hurling all sorts of in insults at him, putting pressure on, and he immediately withdrew. Um, and this essentially marked um, what was going through the pattern for the next four years. Uh, many from the more left sectors of the coalition were calling on his government to not uh, negotiate with the IMF, to not pay with the IMF, saying this is an illegal loan, the people should not have to pay, they should not have to suffer the consequences um, for a loan that the previous government had taken out and had not done anything to help the people. Um, however, again, he goes to the IMF, they negotiate and they agree on a debt repayment schedule. Um, and so people not only saw that he was not going to really, you know, there were changes, there were more uh, subsidiaries, there were more um, social programs, but there wasn't, you know, this radical turn that there needed to be. And this was reflected in the continued deterioration of economic conditions. Of course, he was dealing with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, of the lockdown, of the global economic slowdown. Um, but that still, uh, this of course caused huge impact in the Argentine people's lives. Again, the currency devaluation continued uh, in a very intense way. Inflation, as I said, 2022, the inflation was 100%. Um, so it's it was very, very difficult uh, years under Alberto Fernandez. And so when Millet comes and says, I'm going to do away with all of these sort of policies, these people uh, you know, are doing nothing for you, I'm going to bring around radical change. As we've seen in other countries, it doesn't necessarily matter what that change is. It just matters that there is going to be change. Um, and figures like Alberto Fernandez were clearly uh, did not have the political daringness or the even really the support, the consolidated support behind him um, to actually make changes necessary that would have uh, vastly improved people's lives. And sadly, now it's going to be more of the same austerity policies, which are going to continue to worsen the conditions of people's lives. Um, and the left is at a serious setback because, of course, they were uh, semi in power with the government of Alberto Fernandez, part of the ruling coalition. That's been defeated. Um, so it's definitely going to be, be a period of uh, rebuilding, of assessing, of seeing what happens, um, and strengthening organizations, attending to people's needs. This is going to be a time of great um, material need for the people, just because the economic situation, again, is likely to continue to get worse. Um, so it is going to be, a, a, as I said before, a difficult and interesting couple of years for Argentina. It's unclear 
how many of the proposals that Javier Millet proposed will he actually be able to take forward? Um, many of them are highly unpopular, not only among sectors of the left and uh, working class organizations, but even of the bourgeoisie business owners uh, are not favored by some of the, the proposals that he's making. Um, so again, how will this actually play out? It has remains to be seen, but I think we're going to see a lot of shakeup in Argentina, um, but as well, a lot of resistance, a lot of organizing, and a lot of um, of responding to 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 these these policies that he's going to propose. Thank you, thank you so much, Zoe. Tough times coming ahead, most likely for people of Argentina. We'll be tracking this on Daily Debrief and People's Dispatch as well. The Indonesian hospital in Gaza is once again the target of Israeli occupation forces. At least 12 people have been killed and those in the hospital are under threat. Meanwhile, the attack on Gaza continues to have diplomatic repercussions both in the region and internationally. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. Another week begins and unfortunately, another hospital clearly being targeted by Israel at this point. What is happening at the Indonesian hospital? Uh, as for the latest report, there are 12 people, 12 Palestinians uh, killed in the Israeli tanks when they, they fired their artillery shells on the hospital, particularly targeting the second floor of the hospital where most of the patients are uh, located, where the main operation theater was uh, there. And as for the reports, the operation theater has been completely destroyed. And of course, the Israeli forces have also uh, cut whatever uh, the uh, remaining source of electricity were, were there uh, while surrounding the hospital. There are also reports that since uh, they were uh, shelling uh, all across the uh, uh, locality where the hospital is based, there were also uh, some of the cells were also basically went into uh, Kuwaiti school, which was basically sheltering another thousands of Palestinians there. So uh, though the reports of casualty from that uh, attack is not yet clear, it seems that there are a certain uh, number of people, Palestinians also killed in those attacks as well. Um, as per, uh, of course, the Indonesian government and the Palestinians have condemned the attack. Uh, at, attack and uh, uh, it seems that they are comparing it what happened to the Al-Sifa hospital, where uh, all Palestinian, uh, including the patients, were forcefully evacuated by the Israelis uh, last week, uh, uh, including the uh, 29 premature, 31 premature babies, which were finally had to be transferred uh, through Rafa border to Egypt. Uh, as per the latest report, the babies have reached Egypt and they will be uh, kind of put in uh, into the ventilator, uh, or oh, sorry, uh, into the incubator there. So uh, that has been the uh, report. Uh, uh, Al Jazeera also claimed that there are uh, bodies lying in and around the hospital and because the Israeli tanks are still there and they're still firing, so nobody is in a position to go and retrie uh, retrieve the bodies. Right, Abdul, in this context, of course, a lot happening globally, both regionally and internationally uh, around this war as well. On the one hand, we know that the Houthis uh, also, there's uh, quite a bit of news after the Houthis seized a tanker. So could you maybe talk a bit about that as well? Well, uh, on Sunday, uh, uh, Houthis uh, captured the Galaxy Leader, one, uh, one uh, cargo ship, which, uh, of course, is uh, uh, partially owned by uh, Britishers, Brit a British company, but also partially owned by an Israeli businessman. Uh, as per uh, Houthis' uh, earlier declaration of war against Israelis, Houthis have claimed that uh, until Israel stops its war uh, against Palestinians, its massacre in, in Gaza, they will not. They will keep on uh, uh, kind of attacking Israeli targets, whether it is the ship, it, uh, that is the ships uh, in the into the in the Red Sea or the uh, whatever uh, territories which they, their missiles can reach. Uh, as the, we already know, uh, in last few weeks, uh, Houthis have, have fired uh, uh, several rockets and drones towards uh, the southern Israel. Uh, of course, most of them have missed their target and some of them were intercepted. But still, uh, in that uh, particular uh, uh, scheme, you can say they basically uh, captured the ship. And uh, as per the latest report, though Israel has denied that ship belongs to it and it will any do anything to uh, kind of retry, uh, retake it. But uh, Japanese, which basically 
currently lease the ship. Ship have basically claimed that they are in any in negotiation with Houthis to kind of uh, uh, retake the uh, uh, take the ship back. Uh, so yeah, that is on the on that front. Apart from that, uh, as far as the global uh, aspect is concerned, uh, the uh, we all know last week uh, there was an uh, sorry last last week there was an Arab Israel uh, sorry Arab uh, Islamic summit held in uh, Saudi Arabia, and they had uh, basically formed a ministerial committee which had the task to kind of meet all the members of the United Nations Security Council to convince them to kind of. Uh, put pressure on Israel to stop uh, uh, so that it can stop its war on Palestinians. So they are uh, in the first leg of their uh, international uh, uh, tour. They have reached China and they met the Chinese uh, ministers yesterday. Uh, uh, sorry, on and on Sunday uh, on sorry, on Monday. I'm sorry about that on Monday. And uh, China has promised that it will do anything uh, in its power to end the war and to work for the longer term solution uh, of a two stage solution uh, there uh, uh, there the saudi minister and the egyptian minister have very strongly claimed uh, denied of course the israeli right to uh, right, israeli claim of right to self uh, defense uh, uh, as far as uh, the war in gaza is concerned they have also questioned uh, israel's uh, uh, claims about uh, Hamas being responsible for its attacks on its hospital, uh, because as for the uh, whatever reports we get in media, what we see, most of the Israeli quote unquote evidences which they have presented in media, claiming that uh, the hospital belongs to uh, belonged uh, to Hamas. Hamas used it as a headquarters, Al Shifa in particular, and now Indonesian hospital as well. Uh, is uh, is completely bogus and it, most of them are planted. So all of these things are happening. Uh, let's see what is the result. I think they will also meet other permanent members of uh, the UN Security Council in the coming days. Also, Abdul, finally, very briefly, a, brief, a report appearing, of course, saying that there has been some kind of agreement regarding a potential ceasefire for a few days, but no side confirming it as of now. Well, uh, those reports have been denied both by uh, uh, Hamas and Israeli government, of course, uh, though there are, as you rightly pointed out, there are inconfirmed report uh, from various sources that uh, US and Qatar have been able to kind of clinch a deal between uh, Hamas and Israel to kind of exchange the uh, around 200 plus people who were, uh, who, ha who are, and uh, kept hostage uh, uh, with Hamas in, inside uh, Gaza, as per the reports. Uh, but uh, uh, yet it is not confirmed and Hamas has vehemently denied, at least uh, uh, on its part, that uh, any such deal has been uh, uh, reached. Thanks, Abdul, so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you over the week as developments continue to unfold in this war on the people of Gaza. That's all we have in today's episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with a fresh episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.